Welcome back to the Nikki Clark Show. I'm Nikki Clark, your host, and the show is about transforming lives one story at a time. I invite people from all walks of life to come and share their heart stories, stories of inspiration, upliftment, and taking people to the next level. I'm so excited to invite uh, this wonderful gentleman. He has quite the touching story to share with you all. He is the author of American Criminal Justice System, Inc., and also When Life Doesn't Make Sense. Please welcome Fred Egobor to the show. How are you doing, Fred? I'm good, thank you. Nikki. Excellent, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and thank you so much for my copies of the book. My You're pleasure. Reading, reading this weekend. I have a long <laughs> weekend here in Canada, so yes, that's, that's what I'm gonna be doing. But uh, it's really a pleasure, and, and uh, we have been circling each other over the last couple of years through your wife and through other events. I've heard about you. That's right. And then finally, uh, everything aligned that you're here in the studio today. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's uh, wonderful to have you here. So I guess let's get to it and talk about your background leading to publishing your very first book. Yes, uh, I immigrated from Africa about 25 years ago. Um, came to Canada. Uh, within, after six years, I got a job offer in the United States, Florida. Uh, I worked on a contract as a contract staff for two years. Then I became an adjunct professor briefly in a college. Then I relocated to Texas to work in a healthcare company as a nursing supervisor. That was where I made a wrong turn in life, so to mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. and ended up in prison. And wow. the prison became a trans transformative experience for me. That's what led me to write my book. Mm -hmm. Now, how does a nursing director end up in prison? What, what, what were the circumstances to that? Um, the FBI was investigating the CEO of the company and his wife, who was the CFO, uh, I didn't even realize that there was something going on at the background. Um, the investigation lasted for over a year. Then sometime in May uh, 2012, government agent invited me for an interview. Mm. They said they wanted to just ask me some few questions. They wanted me to help them in their investigation of the right. CEO and his wife. I went there without an attorney because I naively believed that the system works, that if you tell the truth, you have nothing to worry about. Sure. But when I got there, the truth wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't on your side. They wanted me to frame the story in such a way that they can build a case against the CEO of the company, but which will not be a reflection of the truth. But I insisted on the truth. So one of the agents said, I'm going to deal with you Mm. and make sure I send you to prison. Wow. So on May, f on October 4th, that is as precisely four months later, we, I was picked up along with the CEO and the medical director of the company. On the day of our arrest, they got bonded out on bail, but I was kept in detention because I'm not a US citizen. Mm. I spent 18 months in detention. Wow. Before pre-trial. So uh, during the trial, before the trial, the CEO for whom I was being punished took a plea bargain and became a government's cooperating witness in exchange for immunity for his wife and for reduced sentence for himself. So uh, during the trial, the government brought 23 witnesses. He became the only witness against me. Mm. He, didn't, he was not on trial, but the medical director and I were. So uh, during the trial, the jury was hung. They were deadlocked three times. And in each case, the judge you know, asked them to continue deliberations until they reached a decision. Right. The medical director was convicted of all eight charges within the first few hours of deliberation. But the jury said they couldn't make a decision in my own situation. So eventually, the judge issued an alien charge. Alien charge is a charge to, the, to a hung jury, telling them to forgo differences and arrive 
at a decision. Right. And based on the first testimony of the CEO of the company, who said I knew or ought to have known that he was committing fraud, so I was convicted of conspiracy mm. and cleared of all the fraud charges. During the trial, before the trial, my attorney asked for money mm -hmm. to defend me. I couldn't even afford a public attorney. I, had to, I mean, a, a, a private attorney. Right. I had to use a court-appointed attorney. You know, um, the court only gave me 4,800 to defend me. On the government side were six attorneys that worked on the case, 17 FBI agents, and unlimited resources against me. Yet, despite they my are. money school defense team mm -hmm. and lack of resources, all they could get was conspiracy charge, okay. you know, based on first testimony of the CEO of the company. So clearly odds are stacked against you. Uh, you're facing this uh, in uh, this life-changing moment, mm -hmm. and, and you have a family. You have your wife. Do you have any children? I have three children, two boys and one girl. Okay, so they're, they were probably quite young when this was going on? Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot um, of pain and struggle going on. Mm -hmm. Um, so moving forward, you are incarcerated. Um, the, the judge finds you guilty and you have to spend time. How long were you in jail? I was in jail for four years. Uh, it was a very difficult moment for my family. We, we suffered a lot. And in fact, my wife suffered even more. She has to worry about how to raise three restless kids all by herself. Mm -hmm. She has to worry about how to pay the bills. She had to deal with the shame and the stigma of an incarcerated husband. Of course. Yeah. She worried about not knowing if I would even come out of prison alive. But through those difficult and horrible experiences, we learned a lot of useful life lessons. Mm -hmm. One thing with suffering is that after you have suffered, you can't go back in time. Mm. You can't undo what had happened to you. But you can share your experiences from the land of suffering that others may draw strength and inspiration from them. Because whether we like it or not, if we live long enough, bad things will happen. Death of a loved one, relationship problem, illness, financial reversal. No one is ever fully prepared for any of this. Mm -hmm. There's no school of suffering out there <laughs> where people can go to learn to prevent suffering or how to manage it. But we can learn from those who have traveled along that road. Right, right. So you were put on the journey yeah. to teach us through your, through your lessons. That's right. And when did you write this book? I started writing this book while I was in prison. You know, uh, I never planned to be an author, but sometimes when you face a bizarre situation, something that you could never have imagined in your life, then you are on you transition to something that you never planned for. When I got to prison, I was so shocked as to the extent of mass incarceration. How many people I saw that were innocent who were imprisoned. I read books, you know, and see how people have just been locked away, mm -hmm. you know, for no offense at all, for minor offenses. It was in prison, I came to realize that even though America is only 4.3% of the world's population, 25% of global prisoners are resident in America. Mm. 100 million have criminal records. 7 million are under some form of penal supervision. America spends 80 billion every year, according to Congressional Budget Office, to maintain its prison population. That is about 404.1% of their GDP at a time when the national debt is about 22 trillion. If you come to the racial disparity, 13 point, even though the black population is just 13.7%, the blacks constitute 33.9% of the total prison population. Mm. Those are staggering. Yes, yeah, staggering statistics. Staggering statistics. Yeah. Mm. So you're in jail. Um, you, you start to put the book together. Mm. And there's a transformation that happens. Yeah. What happens? You know, one thing 
about hard life, suffering is that when you are faced with a situation over which you have no control, you have to seek a transcendent power. You know, uh, one purpose our suffering can serve is a return to God, the place that we really belong. You know, uh, in good times, most of us behave as if there is no debt. <laughs> but when you face some terrible times, you begin to seek the reality of God. Mm. In, in, in some cases, you know, even people that never knew God at all began to look for a higher power. Mm -hmm. And for those who already know God, you know, adversity deepened their faith. And that was the group I belong. You know, I began to do a lot of things while I was in prison. I began to preach to people. You know, I began to read scriptures, read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you know, trying to find answers for my troubled spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, I was transformed in a very profound way. You know, um, one, I lost grip of, of temporal things and began to forward on things that are eternal. Mm -hmm. You know, suffering causes you to look heavenward. Mm -hmm. You know, in prison, I developed patience. Um, I, I'm usually, an, uh, I'm normally an impatient man, you know, but when you are in prison, you know, you are in a place where you are forced to wait. <laughs> you develop patience. Mm -hmm. In prison, I also learned the art of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is a thing all of us struggle with. Um, like C.S. Lewis said, he said, forgiveness is a lovely idea <laughs> until you have something to forgive. Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, unforgiveness is even more costly. Mm. Unforgiveness is a prison. And the one who refuses to forgive is the prisoner. Mm. With unforgiveness, we yield control of our lives yeah. to those who have wronged us. And we keep paying for their sins. And even though we did nothing wrong, we suffer unnecessarily. Right. You know, I learned from a lot from Nelson Mandela, uh, Dalai Lama, Mahatma Gandhi. These were people who learned to forgive. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison, you know, for his stance against apartheid. But when he came out, instead of seeking retaliation, he sought reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And through that, he brought healing to a divided nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And peace. Yeah, and, and peace, peace to himself. absolutely, yes. Yeah. yes. There's nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, where are you now in terms of the way you deal with conflict and struggle when they come? You just deal with it head on and journey through it? Yeah, we need to understand that uh, if we live long enough, you know, we're going to experience adversity. Mm -hmm. um, in my second book talks about um, when life doesn't make sense, our struggles with faith and destiny. You know, crisis causes us to have doubts. Mm -hmm. When bad things happen to good people, the why question never goes away. Why me? Yeah, why me? Yeah. And we begin to question our faith. We begin to question God. Sometimes we get angry. Mm -hmm. But we can move beyond that and find meaning in our difficulty. You know, we can, there's always, there's some purpose in pain. Uh, we can, you know, eke out some good out of every situation. And moreover, we should not dwell on the past. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we cannot change our past, but we can do something about the future. You know, um, if I check my life, there's that ugly spot of incarceration. But also on that path is a place of purpose, meaning, and restoration. And the birth of these two books. Yeah, that's right. Had it not been from those moments of adversity, mm -hmm. it, it birthed greatness and, and the purpose of helping so many others transform their own lives yes. through your story. That's right. So Yeah, because the, the, the book, um, I had an overwhelming compulsion to tell my story and that of others, an intense desire to do what is right. Awesome. Because... If we turn a blind eye to injustice and allow 
injustice or evil to fester. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we cannot change the world. You know, um, we owe it a duty to do our best, you know, to make sure that the world is a better place. And that means challenging evil wherever they exist. Uh, like Edmund Burke said, he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil mm -hmm. is for good men to do nothing. Mm -hmm. So we have to do our part. We have to do and our that part. is the best of this book. And moreover, you know, um, that readers may benefit from my shared experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, um, after you have traveled through hard road, people can learn and get inspiration Absolutely. from you. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're an absolute inspiration to me mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I know to the viewers there. And where can we get a copy of the book? And where can we follow you on social media? My book is on Amazon, it's on Chapters, it's on Barnes & Noble. It's listed in all major book outlets across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, on Facebook, you can find me on Fred Egobo. Just type my name, Fred Egobo, I'm right here on Facebook. On Twitter, uh, I'm at Egobo. Then you can also find me on Instagram, awesome. Fred Egobo. Okay. And then you can go to my website, www.fredegobo.com. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much it's for your, your courage. Thank you so much for um, your honesty. And uh, I treasure these books. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Fred Ogobo, everybody. Thank you. We'll be back. The Nikki Clark Show, transforming lives one story at a time. If you would like to be a guest or become a part of our live studio audience or even to become a sponsor, just go to www.nikkiclarknetwork.com.